So I want to welcome Kyle to the stage. Uh, we're very honored to have this guest today, and uh, I'm honored the day that he agreed to do this. The roof blew off the building on and, and at the Hoth headquarters because it was a. I said, if you hear a big yell, then you know he's in. And then when I screamed, everybody came running in the office. And said, he's in. I said, he's in. And uh, it was. We were really, really, really excited to have him. And uh, we're just going to do a real. A simple Q&A, like two guys sitting at the bar shooting it, and then we're going to open it up to the uh, to the audience to ask some questions. So I'm just going to dive right into it. Uh, so for those of you who've been living under a rock and uh, you don't know about Kyle Taylor or the Penny Hoarder, Kyle, just give us the uh, the elevator story of, of, of this, this this amazing journey that you've been on, and, and give these guys a little background sure. and maybe uh, you know some 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 fun commentary. How many floors do I have? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so the Penny Hoarder is uh, one of the world's largest personal finance websites. We reach 12 to 17 million uh, uh, unique users every month with our uh, money-saving advice on how to make and save extra money. But it didn't start that way. It started as a very personal blog. Um, in fact, it started as on a, on a free Blogspot account. I was in uh, $50,000 of student loan and credit card debt, and uh, I was at my own personal rock bottom, um, unsure about where my next meal was going to come. And I had been in this place so many times, and I'm sure some of you can relate to this, um, that I was too ashamed, too afraid to call mom and dad again. And uh, the thing that finally helped me was to start writing about it. And um, the blog became my accountability buddy. And it was that for several years. It was my way of sharing my story and, and saying to myself, how much debt are you going to pay off this week? Because you gotta report to your, you got to report to the blog. Right. Accountability. Exactly. And it was that for a couple of years. And then I started hearing from folks that would say, um, hey, thanks for sharing your, your, the side gig that you just got. I just got the same side gig. And I thought, well, that's pretty darn cool. I got someone a job. And it inspired me to start turning it into something more, something into what it is today. Yeah, we'll, we'll we'll tell them a little bit. Not you're being very modest. Let's oh, let's let's you. let's really. <laughs> I, if I have to toot your own horn, I will, Kyle. But let, let's let's tell them where it is today. Let's let's tell them where it got started. How how long? I mean, six years ago you started this thing, right? It was it was obviously. It's been a little over seven years now. Seven years, okay. Yeah, and it, and it, and so the the personal blog portion lasted for for many years. And um, it was a struggle. Uh, the first couple of years, I didn't really make so much. It was an instant success. It was no. like you started it and you made $2 million in a, in a year. No, I wish. It wasn't Bitcoin. <laughs> no, not Bitcoin. Um, it started very slowly. And I didn't even start monetizing the site until several months in. And it was another six months before I got my first check from Google for $100 because that was the minimum threshold. Yeah, yeah 100 bucks. 100 bucks. And um, and it was a couple of years before it was uh, ever enough money to pay off like a car car payment or or, or so massive hard work. I mean, just grinding it out with very little in return in terms of financial exactly. success. If that's how you d define success, exactly. And for me, because I was writing about personal finance, what I would do is during the day I would go out and do all these weird side gigs. One of my favorites is I was a beer auditor. I got paid to go to grocery stores and gas stations. Can I can I get in on that gig? I think we're too old now. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, you had to be under 25. And I would see if they would ID me. And then I got paid uh, for writing a quick little report on whether the cashier asked for my ID. And it was such an interesting gig that most people had never heard of. And it, it quickly became a really popular article on the site. And so I would, I, I would do those sign gigs during the day. And it became fodder for content. And then I would work all night and all weekend on so growing the content blogs. was just 100% transparency. I mean, literally what you were doing, you were blogging about. Yeah, I, I think that's always been so much of our success is that it's a, our personal finance site. has always sure. been very personal. Sure. And um, uh, we, we share real people's stories. And, and for many years, it was mine. All right. Well, I'm not going to let you off the hook. I'm going to make you toot your own horn. So that was the, a little summary of the early yeah. days. Give us just a, a simple summary of where the Penny Hoarder is today in terms of... You know, some of the highlights, the revenue, the size of your office, the staff, and, and Brad, you know, I'm going to let so, you do your own horn a little yeah, bit. Yeah, sure. Um, so we've been named the fastest growing paid, uh, media company two years in a row by Inc. 500. Um, we are about to hire our 100th employee. Congratulations. Thank That's you. awesome. And uh, Hundo, Hundo Club. Hundred Club, and um, last year, um, proud to say, we did thirty-seven million dollars in revenue. Thirty-seven big yeah, ones. Thirty-seven. That's that's awesome. <laughs> Holy cow! On a blog. I mean, essentially, the way to, I mean, it's yeah. the, the origins of it starting as a blog. So when we talk about starting our own blog and, and doing it, if if this story doesn't give you uh, some motivation, I, I don't know what will. Thank you. Very proud of you. Um, 
Let's pretend you have a time machine. Knowing what you know now, what advice would you give yourself six years ago when you first started the Penny Hoarder? You know, hindsight being twenty twenty. Yeah. You go back and you say, now you know everything. Back then, it, you were still trying to figure it out. What would be a couple tips that you would give to yourself six, seven years ago? You know, we were just saying to each other that whenever you're doing something new, it's it's scary as hell. You're you're scared to do it, and I I know I was. Um, I faced that moment several times as I was growing the site, and a couple of times I let that fear hold me back from from doing something even more. I remember the first time the site ever did five thousand dollars in revenue in a month. That was more money than I had ever made in a month from any of my other jobs. And I, I was blown away. I was like, wow, this is, this is incredible. This is as good as it's yeah, going to get. This is as, yes. I, if I can just do this, if I can just do this every single month, if I can just make $5,000, how amazing would that be? And it was a few days later, I realized, what is this limit I'm putting yeah, on well, myself? I'm putting limits on I'm myself. I'm putting a limit on myself. My That's what I'm worth is, is $5,000. And I've done that many times. Um, I, I, I didn't hire my first employee until I um, had already done $5 million in revenue. What? Because I was scared. I was scared to hire someone. I was scared to turn it into something more. So you're saying this could have grown even faster I, if you had taken it more probably, gambles. It probably I mean, could this have. Is, this, is, this is growth with yeah. being conservative. It's, it's, it's crazy. So if I could go back, I would tell myself to, to go for it, to trust myself. Be a little more aggressive yeah. and believe in yourself and set bigger goals. Absolutely. Great. I love that. I love that. We've heard that several times throughout this, this, this event. So you're, you're echoing what other speakers have already said. Set bigger goals. Great. Um, this is helpful to a lot of our, our people in the audience. Uh, I would assume that the penny hoarder gets contributor submission requests by the thousands or high, high amounts. So what are some of the key elements you look for uh, for a good fit for somebody who is submitting a contribution to your site? And what advice can you give to our audience to help make their contributor uh, request applications stand out when applying for publications like the Penny Hoarder or other major media yeah. outlets because it's so competitive to get stuff published. So it is. Yes, we get a lot of pitches, and um, I one of the most important things to us is your portfolio of work. We don't care that you've been published on Forbes or MSNBC, but we care about the quality of writing um, that's been published elsewhere. And I will say what makes a really good pitch, at least for us, is when there's something that we haven't heard before. And that's generally going to be something very personal. If you're, if you're telling a story about um, you know, how, how you got a promotion at work, um, we don't want to hear that you were nervous talking to your boss. Go, go a layer deeper than that. You know, tell us about how you forgot to wear deodorant that day and you were sweating. And, and that, that stuff is real and it's, it's, it's easier for our readers to identify with. Great. That's helpful. So uh, now that you're the CEO of Inc. 500, fastest growing, you know, one of the fastest growing media companies, uh, you're in hyper growth mode. You know, what are your next level goals? You know, kind of like you just said, you you want to you want to you want to think bigger. So now you've you, you've just reiterated that. So you want to think it's you know you're you're big and you want to think bigger. So uh, you know, what are your goals now? How do you stay motivated? And what drives you to come into the office every day? You know, to get these big numbers. Clearly, it's more than just the, the, the money that you're making. So, you know, what, what makes you want to get up and, and, and go into that office every day? It is, yeah. Did anybody see uh, Oprah's speech at the Golden Globes? Did you all see that? Well, it was, uh, of course, an amazing speech, but um, backstage, she did a Q&A, and they asked her, um, you know, all these years working on the Oprah show and, and, um, and now creating your own network, like, aren't you, aren't you tired? Aren't you done? done. Tap out, Oprah. And, uh, and she's... <laughs> No one tells Oprah to tap out. <laughs> Nobody tells Oprah anything except for yes, ma'am. <laughs> and, uh, and she said, you know, I, I, I worked on the O show for all those years. They were long days. Oftentimes I would come home so tired I couldn't even take my clothes off because I'd worked so hard. And I knew I had to be back in the studio four hours later. And she's like, I'm working on a network, a brand new thing I'd never done before. But in all those years, I often felt tired, but I never felt depleted. And that's because I was working on something that I was passionate about and aligned with what my purpose is in life. And I thought, I get it. I get it. That was the moment for me. I was like, I get it. Um, because I, I so often feel the same way. There are long days, but I never feel I never feel like I can't come in the next day. And that's for me, my passion is, uh, is taking some of the stress out of, out of finances. Um, Bankrate did a study a couple months ago. 65% of us have less than $500 in a savings account and are not sure how they could handle the next emergency. 
That's something I know all too well. And some, been there. Yeah, I've You've been there, there for many years. And so I'm passionate about fixing that. And I think I, I think I can do it by using storytelling and journalism and combining them into a powerhouse. And you said you asked me about big goals. Yeah. My big goal is I want to be the next Disney. I want us to build a media wow. company that big um, that uses storytelling to make a difference in people's lives. That's big. I like it. That's a big goal. And, I'm not uh, thinking small anymore. No, we're done, we're done with small goals. That's great. So you basically, you know, if you love what you do, it doesn't yeah. feel like work is what you're telling us. It, you, you'd come and you, you can't get enough of it. Yeah, it's, it's about loving what you do, but it's also about who deep down inside you are. What is your purpose? What were you brought here to do? And I firmly believe my purpose is to use my storytelling skills to help people uh, make a difference in their financial uh, uh, in their finances. Yeah, well, clear, clearly it's working by the, the, the head count, the, the revenue, the success. I mean, it's, this is not a it's, – it's helping people, and I think I guess you put that first before the revenue. If you help the people, the revenue comes. Yeah, I think too often when you're thinking about the money first, that's yep. usually yep. things that blow up in your face. Yeah, well, that leads right into my next question. So uh, for our audience that has a relatively new blog or is in the process of launching their blog, you know, what advice can you give them and how do they balance – between uh, creating content and generating revenue, you know, and which is yeah. more important in the early stages, and in your opinion, you know, what forms of revenue should they focus on, uh, t- you know, to t- 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 stay motivated to some degree, like to hit that first 5,000, you know, there's lots of different, you know, affiliate, there's sponsors, there's native ads, there's ad sense, there's displays, all these different types of advertising, and uh, if you could just touch on what were some of the main revenue drivers in the early days of the penny hoarder. Sure. Um, well, I do think um, creating content is by far the most important thing. You're not going to make a dime unless you've got something really chasing the money, really without compelling. Any content, you're yeah. wasting everybody's time. Yeah, but I, I do want to say I don't think you should completely forget forget about how you're going to pl- monetize this content. As I mentioned early on, I I didn't have any advertising for the first several months, and then I because um, I didn't know anything about blogging or advertising, and I learned finally what an AdSense ad was, and I put it on the site. And I got to say, it was motivating. Yeah, the first dollar. Well, yeah, it was eleven cents for me, eleven cents a day. But it was it was motivating. I like check. You made your first dollar bill online. It wasn't even a dollar bill, but it, well, you made money online, and that felt good. It did. And I and I started, you know, you start doing the math in your head, like, okay, eleven, 11 cents, cents a day, day. times thirty years, I could buy yeah. a cup of coffee. I, yeah, I'm on my way. <laughs> uh, but it was it, it was uh, fun to think about what the possibilities. Yeah. Were. And so I, I don't think you ignore that forever. In terms of the kind of revenue, I've been very um, uh, criti- uh, critical of display advertising. Um, it was the earliest form of advertising on the penny hoarder. We got rid of it a little over a year ago. And um, I, I firmly believe that it is a, um, um, it's a, it's a little bit of a dying industry. Um, click-through rates have been declining for 10 years. Ad rates um, on banner ads have been continuing to decline displays for 10 are, years. Displays like the commercials of television, are, it's a dying. Yeah, You know, if you think about uh, newspapers uh, who have obviously had so much trouble in the last 20 years. Trouble is a, is a, is a kind is word. A, it's the same kind of advertising that they <laughs> were relying on. It, it's a, a, um, if a, a picture or a, a quick little giphy that doesn't really do much to tell a story or a brand story. Uh, so what I'm a fan of, especially for bloggers, is um, either creating your own product, whether that be a course or, or um, some, something that you can sell, or affiliate revenue, um, selling something else that um, somebody else has created. And uh, that's now the way we make money on the penny hoarders through performance, uh, um, performance marketing. We work with brands like General Mills, Uber, Lyft, and we tell their brand story in our voice. And then they pay us. Every time someone signs up to be a Lyft driver, we get a paycheck. Not for an impression, not for a view, but for, for an action. Exactly. All right. So they know your stuff converts. If it doesn't convert, you don't get paid. So you, you've got skin in the game, and they love that, right? You're taking more risk up front, so the advertisers are easy to get. We, don't, we have a very small sales team because it, it's not a sale. But the advantage is, is because you're taking the risk up front, the rates that you're going to make are much, much higher than the dollar or two dollars that you would earn from a banner ad. Sure. Or in my case, 11 cents. 11 cents, yeah. <laughs> so uh, moving in different types of content, uh, what role will video play uh, for internet content publications in 2018? And briefly describe to our audience, you know, the Penny Horse video strategy in 2018 and where, where you guys are at with this, where you see it, how you, you're primarily a content company that's mostly written, but I'm, I'm assuming that's going to evolve and yeah. 
Yeah. Just tell the audience where you see video. Well, we're in the middle, uh, as, uh, as an industry, we're in the middle of video apocalypse right now. I would agree with that. Uh, for for the last couple of years, there's been this uh, this talk about pivot to video. Video is where we're going to get more money. We're gonna we're gonna see higher rates from advertisers, and um, part of that was true, but uh, it became very saturated, and many brands never found a way to monetize um, their videos, especially the kind of videos that you see on Facebook all day long. Um, does anybody watch uh, those videos where they're sort of like top down? You get to make someone watch food. Yeah. I, yeah. I watch them. Yeah, I watch them all day long. Well, I think you're going to see, see some like 18 million views. Like 18 million people wanted to watch so this, you know, this dish get made. But yeah, it's, it's true. They're uh, they're addicting as hell. But I think you're going to see a lot less of that kind of content in the coming years because no one's making any money from it. And instead, um, uh, brands, including the Penny Hoarder, are really starting to focus more on long form video. Um, and that might be on YouTube. It might be on cable TV or a, a, an OTT ser- service. But something where uh, there's a more clear advertising model where you can actually put a brand placement in or you can show a commercial and make a buck from it. Yeah, you're actually solving a question through the video versus just entertaining me while I, while I wait for my buddy to show up for lunch. Yeah, it's, it's tough because a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, brands have put their whole strategy on this. And so I think we're going to see a little, bit of, a little bit of carnage in the coming months. Yeah. But – I'm hopeful that it's going to lead to better things, including better video quality, because so much of it is, um, I've been pretty crummy, to be honest with you. Yeah, I would agree with that. What advice or tips can you give to uh, some people in our audience or other people who may watch this video later that are living as a writer, doing freelance gigs? And, uh, you know, what can they do to really increase their value proposition uh, with whatever marketplace or with clients, you know, if, if you're writing? What advice would you give? Well, I, I think one of the things um, that a lot, of, a lot of writers make the mistake of doing is pricing themselves too cheaply. Um, I, I will tell you that um, when, you get a, when you get an email in your inbox from somebody offering you a $25 or $50 article, it automatically <laughs> makes you think that the quality is not right. going to be the same. You're going to make me give out a lot of raises, Kyle, so let's, let's <laughs> slow down. Let's slow down with the... With the, with the I'm just teasing. <laughs> so... I think I think ask for more money. <laughs> yeah, well, I I would agree with that. Yeah. Um, so let's tell us a little bit about the non-business, Kyle Taylor. You know, what do you do when you're not working? What are your hobbies? What are your passion? What do you do outside? I mean, do, is there anything outside the office? It's sleep, and then you go into the penny order. <laughs> some days, some days it is like that. Yeah. Um, no, for, for me, I uh, I've had the same group of friends here for 20 years, and. Um, it's been really important as the company has scaled that I um, still set a little time aside each week to not be a CEO. And so I have a, um, a tradition every Thursday night, uh, my group of friends and all the kids, because we all are older now, uh, get together and, uh, and we have a night of just games and laughter. So following this, that's where I'm headed. Staying true to your roots and keeping yeah, your, 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 your crew that was there before you were the big shot. Once the kids go to bed, we play Mario Kart all night. <laughs> yeah. do, you, do you find do you, Mario Kart? Yeah. I love it. Do you find that you have to create more of a wall now, being being exposed? Every, you know, as you get successful, people come out of the woodworks and people want favors and people. You know, do, do, how do you stay protected? And, and, and do you, or is it? Do you have? Do you have? Do you have that challenge where? You have you create your barriers and your uh, you know your gatekeepers to to yourself and your time. Um, I try not to put gatekeepers uh, in in front of me. I, I still answer all my own emails, take my own phone calls. Um, but I I do think that uh, and this is important no matter where what kind of business you have. Um, you have to be really careful about what you're saying yes to. And I, there's a a really good phrase. Uh, there's a book called Essentialism, and there's several others have written the same thing. That if it's not a strong yes, it's a hell no. It's a hell no, exactly. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm tr- struggling to learn how to say I, no, and it's 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 difficult. But. I think about this every day because you know every day there's five or six requests in LinkedIn, like let's get a cup of coffee, and and uh, um, if I, I yeah, I think I was that guy at one point, you know. But I said yes to you because it was a hell yes. Like, damn right, you it did. was a hell yes. Damn right, you did. But if I said and yes, you were busy. I mean, you were in a twenty-two thousand square foot build out. I mean, you were a busy guy. But if I said yes to all of that, can you imagine how much caffeine I'd have to drink oh every goodness. day? <laughs> yeah, a lot. But thank you for <laughs> thank you for saying yes. And uh, you know, I don't know what the pitch was, but it must it must it have worked. So. <laughs> um, give our audience some big mistakes. You know, obviously now you've figured it all out. So give you know people make mistakes. So give these guys some yeah. examples of some big mistakes you made. 
when you, you know, pre and post penny hoarder to show that, you know, you're not perfect. We all make mistakes and maybe some examples of what you would have done differently in those mistakes. Hindsight, obviously being 2020. Yeah. Well, I'm still making big mistakes. That never <laughs> ends. Um, you just make it look good. <laughs> and then the mistakes are just bigger. <laughs> they bigger, cost more money. More expensive. Right? <laughs> um, I remember in year three, I, I, um, I was still reliant on uh, revenue from Google AdSense. That was all of my revenue. And I, uh, I got an email one day from Google AdSense, and they said, we've detected some fraud on your account. Um, we're shutting you down. And um, any revenue you've ach- you, that is in your account right now is... Gandhi. Bye-bye. I had two thousand dollars in that account, which was rent money for me for a couple of months, and um, that was a low moment for me. That was a low moment um, because I really wondered if I should keep blogging at that point. But what I learned from it was to diversify myself. Diversify the income stream. Yeah. You relied on one big check, and if that check didn't come in, you were. BK. Yeah. And, and we do that now with clients. Um, if any client starts to get over 10% of our total revenues. Find another one in the same yeah. vertical. Like, okay. Compete, have them compete. Who, for, yeah. Exactly. Who, who's your competitor? Who can we bring in? Diversify uh, that revenue stream. I like that. It's a great one. Yeah. That's the only mistake you made? Come on. You, oh, my you just gosh. Get, let's, you talked about the re, getting real in the story with the deodorant and the underwear. I mean, that's – get real. Tell me some mistakes. I want some dirt. I want some – some big mistakes, some, something so when I sink teeth and we're trying to get this story published. That's, that's I've, made, I've made a lot, of, um, a lot of hiring mistakes. I've made some management mistakes. Uh, my background before working on um, uh, the Penny Hoarder was I worked on political campaigns. And I was working on a campaign as, and I was a, 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 a field, organized, field manager. So I managed a, a group of people that would go door to door getting out the vote. And uh, we all lived together. Which is, <laughs> so you lived with all the people you worked we with. We lived with all the people we worked with um, because campaigns. If you, if uh, if any of you ever worked on one, they're kind of like a commune. Like it, it's your life. It's what you do all day. You eat together. You drink together. And in our case, we lived together, and um, it got very comfortable. And I remember one day, um, one of the employees brought in um, some cigarettes, but they weren't cigarettes. <laughs> and left hand cigarettes. Yeah. And I thought to myself, oh, we're too close. <laughs> oh, you think that's okay. Yeah. And uh, um, I've ha- I had some other um, experiences in the same realm. People uh, who come, in- come to work drunk or, or come to leave work early or come to work um, stoned. And I thought to myself, you know what? I'm not putting up appropriate boundaries. I'm not learning to say no to, this is unacceptable to my behavior. employees. And, uh, um, and I can't be living with, <laughs> with folks. And so I, I've, I've taken that now to the penny horror where um, it's important that from a culture perspective that I know my employees and they know me and that we, we spend time together outside of work. But there is a careful boundary right. that I know. Right. Um, we, when we had that first lunch, you told me something that uh, it shocked me. And I, 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 it may shock the audience that, that you, know, you don't have any display revenue and that right. one-tenth – only one tenth of the content that you guys put out actually even has a monetization. You know, it's all performance-based marketing. So, if a content doesn't have a performance-based call to action, it can't generate any revenue. But it shocked me that you said about one tenth of your content actually has revenue-generating triggers. And uh, um, I just wanted to, you know share a little bit about that strategy. Obviously, it's working, so it's a great strategy. But yeah. Had I not heard it from you, I would have never implemented. I mean, every blog post has to have a call to action. And uh, if you could just share with us how you came up with that strategy, why it works, and because I think it would provide a lot of value for people trying to create a blog, thinking that every piece of content has to make money. Yeah, I think it's even less now. And I, I you know, people aren't coming to my site or anyone else's because uh, for the advertising. I mean, we hope that our advertising is helpful and, and that, you, that you're going to find a good product or service, but that's not why you're coming yep. to the site. You have problems to solve, and, Ex- and you want to solve the problems. Exactly. And so that has to be at the forefront of what we do, is how can we help this customer, help this reader solve whatever problem it is that they've come to us for. And if every single time there's a call to action or, or hard sell us Get trying you. to send you to, to an advertiser, um, chances are you're not going to stick around for much longer. And so our, our strategy um, as a company is to first focus on loyalty. How can we, when, this, when somebody comes to our site for the first time, how can we retain them forever? 
How can we get them to keep coming back to our site over and over again? And one of the reasons that's been so important to us is that while we are a distributed um, media company, meaning we publish um, content on Facebook and Instagram and Google, um, we don't want to be reliant on any of those platforms. And we really, we really want the reader to know our name and not just be seeing us on Facebook. So you, you actually are living, you're putting the user engagement way above advertisers. They're, they're, they're secondary and the user experience is clearly number one. I think it's like we were talking about earlier when, when all you're doing is thinking about the money, yeah. it's, uh, something's going to go wrong. Yeah, I agree. Well, it's working for you, and I think it's great insight to sh you know for everybody to really absorb that if you cr create great content, the money will follow. Well, it, it has a better chance of following than if you're just chasing the money or putting the content out there to, to, to make money. Um, uh, do you see a bright, uh, bright future for niche startup publications uh, like the Penny Hoarder you know, now today? You know, obviously, the big guys have gotten bigger. Uh, Vice, BuzzFeed, the Penny Hoarder, you know, old school media is in there. And is there still an opportunity for the small guy out there to become the next Penny Hoarder? Is, is, that, is, that, uh, is that window closing? Is it gone? Is it still the same opportunity today as it was back then? And, and just your, your, your insight, if you were starting today with nothing and you, had, you were 50000 in debt, what, do you still think this strategy still works? Or is it, is it one of those things that it was, it was a time and is it gone or is it still there? Um, yes, I think it's still possible. Um, I read I read the other day, though, it is getting harder. Um, I read the other day that there are now, um, I think, 500 million blogs on Tumblr alone. And they're not even the biggest platform. Like, that doesn't even right. in include WordPress. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of blogs. There's a lot of blogs. And um, and you can find one for just about any, any niche um, possible. Um, I, I, I love... Um, uh, fun fact, I love to play Monopoly. And um, I found a blog the other day that is just for people who love Monopoly. Like, how random is that? Um, so there are a lot of blogs, and I think it is still possible, but you got to figure out a way um, to be different and to have and it, it, have a, a niche and a voice um, that is something that people haven't heard before. Right. Okay. Um, this is an interesting question, especially topical uh, just within the last couple of weeks since he was in our office. But, you know, major media company was forced into bankruptcy because of one single blog post literally happened right here in St. Petersburg. You know, as a journalism, as a, as a CEO of a, of a major publication, do you have any thoughts or opinions on the Hulk Hogan versus Gawker case? And has the outcome of this case affected your editorial approval process before content is pushed live? Oh, you're going to get me in trouble with that one. <laughs> Um, Hogan was just in our office, so you know he could pop in the door at any minute. So <laughs> he might be behind the curtain. So be careful. <laughs> oh Lord! Uh, well, I will tell you that uh, we did. We already are a double editing company, so two editors, two, look, two rounds before stuff two goes live. Would it have saved Gawker? Maybe, maybe, maybe look not. At, look at every post. I, you know, Gawker. So much of Gawker was about pushing the envelope, and that was about the, that was their culture as well. And um, and so for us, I'm not. I have no idea what's going to be on the on the website today. I really don't. Um, and so at some point, you have to be able to trust. You have to let go and have, trust your people that you've hired to do the right thing. You have to be able to trust your editorial team. But um, I think building a culture that uh, um, cares about the same things is is a big part of that. Um, I will tell you the one thing that we did do after that happened. Is, uh, <laughs> you did something. We, yeah, we doubled our liability <laughs> insurance. Doubled the liability insurance. Sure. Yeah. I was like, calling the attorneys. What can we do? Yeah. Um, it's scary, and I, I, I don't think this is going to be the last one like this. We are definitely in a moment now where we're exploring the boundaries of of what the First Amendment means uh, for bloggers, and of course, the FTC has come out with so many things about um, truth, Disclosure. truth, and disclosures. So, honest Abe. We're still we're still all figuring it figuring it out. So, um, and you, what is the definition of disclosure? You know, is is it is it you, you know, and it'll all get figured out. But you guys are taking precautions to protect to protect the mothership. Protect the mothership. I like that. <laughs> protect the mothership. I like it. Um, well, it's undeniable you're a fashionable guy. You know, tell us where you shop for your clothes. What are your favorite brands? So, you know. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> This is uh, this is J Crew. This is yeah. Um, I shop a lot of different places. I uh, a little, I, little more specific. I haven't I haven't done a lot of um, 
a lot of traveling overseas, but I'm, uh, my favorite city is London, and so I'm really I'm really inspired by menswear in London. So you'll actually, if you ever come to our office, you'll see it. There's a lot of a lot of plaids, a lot of <laughs> a lot of velvets and things like that. Um, but I will tell you my trick to, to clothes shopping. Can I tell you? Because I love to hear. It. I I still use coupon for everything. Is um, is to use a site like Abata or Ebates, um, and you can get up to. You just click on their site first, and they have the affiliate links. They get the affiliate links. Yeah, You're yeah. contributing back to the ecosystem, making you know, give, giving they, back to the. They share the revenue with you, and sometimes well, I get, they share it back to you in the form of a discount, or you're getting a piece of the action. Exactly. Sometimes up to like twenty five percent. Yeah. So even with all that money and all the success, you still you still are true to your roots and stay. Why, why would I leave free money on the table? <laughs> free money. I love it. Um, tomorrow you wake up and you find a bottle on the ground. You pick up that bottle. You take the cork out. A genie pops out. It says, Kyle, <laughs> three wishes. What are they? Um, well, number one, I want to be able to, I want to be able to eat pizza and drink beer without gaining weight the rest of my life. <laughs> that, Great wish. Every day. Every day. If you figure that one out, we'll start a new blog. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I I think I um I I also would love to see if, since since personal finance is, is my passion um one of the big problems we've had with uh personal finance is that wages have not kept up with either inflation or productivity so I would love to see wages start climbing at the same rate as productivity is, and uh sort of even the field between uh employees and 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 the people they work for um and then lastly, you know, I just I just want to keep smiling every day I come to work. I think that's probably the best. Not losing the inner, not losing the happiness, just keep it alive. Yeah, I think as long as I have that, I'm gonna I'm gonna feel good. What about happens life. the day you, you it, it 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 isn't fun to go in the office? What happens the day you let's say heaven forbid you walk in, you'll stop. Yeah, yeah. If it ever stops becoming fun, I'm done. Yeah. Well, you can't you can't be effective if if if, if it's not fun, right? No, you, no. Who would want me going there? through the motions? Right. Yeah. <laughs> Let's hope that doesn't happen. You get, you get 100 people that are, that are counting on you. So. Where's this genie? That's what. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I, I, I thought it was a great question, though. <laughs> I, had, I, had, I had to sell Marianne and get this gig, you know, so I, was, I had to do my homework. You know, it was, wasn't, a, cookie, wasn't yeah. a hell yes right away. It was <laughs> vet this guy. What does he want me to do? So I had, I, had, I, had, I, had to, I had to get the hell yes, you know, to get you. So I, I do have a little two. bit of a protector. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know your I know your gatekeeper, so I knew that answer was bull crap. You know what I mean? I was I wanted I wanted I was trying to get him to acknowledge some props over here. And he, you know, seriously, you know, Marianne here. She is worth her weight in gold. Best. And if is you don't say it on stage, I will. It is the absolute best. You know, I have to tell you really quickly. Um, I got an I got an email at like ten o'clock last night, um, telling me what to expect today. And oh, I'd love to see what that email said. And. Uh, she she told me about um, who I'd be meeting with, what I should wear. What she? Wow, she I didn't sh- get that email. She shared some Instagram photos from the event, so I could see like what the oh what it was goodness. like. I don't so even know. talk about good prep work. She is good. <laughs> and she is a great gatekeeper. She's she needs a raise. Yeah. Sharpen your pencil, Kyle, with that one. I know. So, uh, um, so St. Petersburg. One of the things we talked about when we were at lunch is I think we're both uh, we we have technology, media, you know, internet-based marketing companies here in St. Pete, and there's not a lot of us here. So, you know, when I was pitching this event and talking about this event as what's good for us is good for you, getting talented people to, to move here, to want to relocate, to live here is important for both of us, you know, for both of our firms to be able to get the top talent. And uh, so give me, you know, St. Petersburg, pros and cons, and, and, and where do you, do you see – St. Pete is a viable city for companies like yours and ours to grow, and can can we get talent to come here? Yeah, well, I'm I'm St. Pete obsessed, um, so uh, I'm, I'm right, there, right there with you. I, the love, the, I love this city. A strong yes for me. I think um, one of the best parts about this city, especially uh, among the startup community, is that our culture is that we all genuinely want to help each other, and that's not something that um, I think exists everywhere else. Um, when somebody calls somebody a startup or owner or CEO from around town sends an email, we get together because that's what that's what we do here. And I, I also um, all my years working on campaigns, 
I I saw a lot of dysfunction, a lot of dysfunction. Um, people had different ideas about what their city should be. Um, I think St. Pete as a whole, especially in our local government, we are all very united around the same idea. Like we want to be the tech capital, ca- tech capital of Florida. Right. We want to be um, the arts capital of Florida. And so for a company that cares about arts and tech, like it is, yeah. it is the perfect you found your home, yeah. hub for us. Yeah. Um, one of the challenges we have, though, is um, we have a little bit of stigma from the last 30, 40 years. Yeah. Uh, we, before, we were uh, known as the shuffleboard capital <laughs> and, um, or, or the more perverse like, uh, um, was, was way of calling it was God's waiting room. I think right, I've heard God's that a few room. times. Um, and so we, <laughs> we, we have a little bit of a, of a struggle of shading that, that older image that we're, we are a, uh, a hip place, a place where, where, um, businesses are growing and thriving. Yeah. So next question, tell me uh, real quickly, you know, if you could define what you think the culture is at the Penny Hoarder and, and, and you know, I was able to go in your office, so yeah. I got a little sense of it. I've worked with Marianne and I'm, you know, engaging with, with some of, some of your staff you know, just tell me if you could define you know the culture that you have there, and is it yeah. is it is it is it is it very focused that you're 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 building that culture and it's driven, or did it take a life of its own? You know, if you could define you know the life and the day working at, at the penny order, how would you how would you kind of define the culture? Well, it's continuing to change. Yeah. I mean, the first five employees started at my kitchen table, and um, the culture was a lot different then yeah. right like they were hang out with my you dog you can't do the same thing at 50 employees that you did at five and you can't do the same thing at, at 100 that you did at 50. it changes it it does change and i think you have to be comfortable with that but um at the heart of it are shared values that is that is the most important thing for company culture and this is this is an exercise that our company did together was to figure out what our shared values are we 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 knew we, we wanted collaborated to, together to define the, the culture exactly. and the mission statement we knew we wanted to be kind so we tell people to check their ego at the door no one no one wants an asshole working with working with them um we we knew we wanted to be leaders that we wanted to think really big and to make sure that employees didn't have to ask for permission that they could be free you allow free to them make. to fail on, on you know allow them to, to fail and to do that they can succeed but they have to be able to take risks and exactly feel comfortable doing that in the, and it has to be within the culture yep um and then we knew we wanted to be bold we knew we wanted to do things that nobody else was doing um i i can't tell you um, how many times people say to you in a day, like, well, why aren't you doing this? Like, BuzzFeed's doing that. Vox is doing that. Like, we're not BuzzFeed. We're not BuzzFeed. And, um, it, and we never will be because they have $500 million. <laughs> so yeah. so we, have to, we have to think differently right. about things. Um, and then we knew we wanted to have a fun workplace. I think you guys have that, oh, too. Yeah. That leads right into my next question. And, and there's no way we're going to be able to describe this on stage, but I'm going to attempt to. You know, I had the pleasure, Clayton and I, you know, and I'm pretty proud of our office because we just built out our office. We hired the same designer that, that you guys, Lisa, Lisa Gilmore is awesome. I'm going to give her a plug. She's, <laughs> her and her whole crew is awesome. But, uh, you know, I was able to see your 22,000 square foot office and it blew me away. I had to check my ego, you know, at the door because when I walked in, it was like, wow, this is awesome. So uh, it was very inspirational. So if you just tried to describe, you know, the, some of the highlights of, you know, the, the, the rooms with the presidents. I mean, it, this was well thought. Was this all Lisa? Did you collaborate? I mean, it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's an amazing place. And, uh, and I'm sure that plays into your culture and, and recruiting and all that kind of stuff. So just, just give these guys a little a Yeah, little absolutely. Um, Toot so your horn about this office because it's oh, awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we're an open office environment. So our, our 22,000 square feet is, it fits about 120 employees. Um, but we knew we wanted to have cool little areas where you could get away. Um, I'm an introvert, and after about six hours of meetings, like I need a couple hours of quiet, and I need a couple hours where I can't see anyone. So some of the features we have, we have an indoor park. Um, that's Asher turfed and has has an ocean view, so people grab a beanbag or a yoga mat. And um, we have a uh, a quiet room where twice a day we have voluntary uh, meditation, guided meditation, and we have these big. Um, they're kind of like first class lounge pad. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna lose all my employees, guys. <laughs> The best part about it, though, is not only is it quiet in there and all the lights are off, but you're completely surrounded and you can't see anybody. And five times a day, somebody comes in and brings hot cookies. I'm just kidding. No, no, no. (laughs) But we should make that happen. (laughs) 
it is it is amazing. I mean, they have they have set the bar at the coolest office space that I've ever seen. And 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 so, where did this come from? Was this all Lisa's idea? Did you have a vision? Was it a collaborative effort? I mean, there was time and energy really put into the. And talk about the meeting spaces and the reserved times. I mean, it is well thought out. It is a work of art. Thanks. Yeah. No, it was definitely a huge collaboration. Um, uh, Lisa and I were Pinteresting for about six months, <laughs> so um, there's a lot of thought put into it. We we cover what's. I mean, let's face it, personal finance is a topic that most of us find pretty boring and or and pretty... Right, right up there with, with SEO and, and... Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and pretty traditional. Um, but we try to do it in a really fun and entertaining way. And so we wanted the space to play off of both of those. So uh, there's a lot of traditional furniture, like... Yeah. Like old Chesterfield sofas and antiques. It's got a modern feel with with antique. Yeah, type, type we have a dinosaur wall. head over our fireplace. Like we, we have a moose. <laughs> we have a moose head. So I, I, I like it. I like it. So we wanted to have fun with it as well. And so you mentioned the rooms. Our rooms are, many of them are uh, folks that are on money. So we have um, a Lincoln room and a Tubman room. And then we have we have um, some fun ones like a St. Pete room as well. Cool. Well, that's all the questions I have. I wanted to make sure we save time because I, I, uh, the opportunity to ask you questions is something that doesn't, doesn't come along very often. So let's, let's open up the group and get some fire away at Kyle, guys. I'm going to bring a mic back. Hi. Um, so obviously Penny Hoarder started as your personal bank account, like your habits and this and that. Was there ever like an oh shit type of moment in the beginning when you were like, wow, like I'm literally putting myself out there, like people know my life and like da 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 da. Like how did you balance that? Also mentioning that you're an introvert and then just putting yourself online like that. Yeah. No, I have that moment still. <laughs> I'm having that moment right now. <laughs> um no, it's a challenge, and it's one Mary and I, Marianne and I, talk about a lot. Is uh, um, um, how far, how far to push it. I will say, going back to what I what I said at the very beginning, um, now my motto is is like whenever I'm uncomfortable doing doing something, I probably should push myself through it. And so that's something I tell myself. I, I do take I do think about it more, like. Um, uh, when the Uber driver drops me off at home and, you know, asks me what I'm doing, what I do for work, and I'm like, oh, my goodness, this person knows where I live and work? Like, that's a little scary. Um, so I do th I do think about it, and I... I uh, where do you live and where do you work? <laughs> well, I'll tell you where I work. I work in the building a couple blocks down in the old Tampa Bay Times building. Next question. All right. Um, considering... Murray. What's up, buddy? Hey. Um... Considering, like you said, uh, personal finance isn't exactly like the most thrilling topic. Yeah. Um, and then on top of that, how many times can you tell people to, do, you know, get a 401k or IRA? Um, what is Penny Hoarder doing to kind of keep the um, content fresh? In terms, yeah, that's of, a really you know, good question. What's, what's the long term? The, uh, yeah, great question. I remember. Uh, uh, when we hired these first five folks and we were sitting around the kitchen table, we wrote our first, um, uh, what we called a strategy doc. And one of the big questions, the first question we put in there was that we had to figure out this year is, is there enough we can even write about? Like, aren't we going to run out of topics? <laughs> and uh, now when I look back at that, like, we always get a, get a chuckle. And I think that's because of two things. One, we focus on um, personal storytelling, and we're never going to run out of people's stories to tell, and they all are a little bit different. We find that when if we give an article about how, why you should open up a 401k, um, not only is it boring, but no one does it. Um, but if I tell you about um, somebody who is your same age and maybe has the same number of kids you do and has some, had some similar experiences as you, and I tell you about their failures and I tell you about uh, what finally motivated them to open up a 401k, you're probably much more likely to do it because it's something you relate to and it's personal. And we're, we'll never run out of those. Uh, we've also found that um, money touches everything in our lives. And the number of topics that we can write about has continued to expand. Uh, last year, we um, introduced a food category. So now we share um, easy ways you can save at the grocery store or cheap meals you can make for your family at night. And uh, we've got 100 more of those that in the pipeline. Evergreen. Yeah, things that you, that way, uh, ways that we can help save you a buck. Uh, hi, hi, Kyle. Uh, uh, I just moved here uh, from Massachusetts, actually, to grow a similar business. Awesome. Welcome. Uh, I've been in it uh, five years now, and I'm basically at a point where 
I'm trying to take it uh, from an individual business where I'm running and kind of managing everything to growing it into kind of a, a lar thing much larger than me. Yeah. And I wondered, uh, you know, as somebody who's younger and hasn't had the experience in business uh, doing that myself, did you have a mentor or someone that kind of, when you had questions about growth or um, development of the company beyond yourself that you could kind of turn to? And, and also in that sense, uh, is there, with the startup community you mentioned, or smart startup committee, is there somewhere locally that you could kind of find that? Yeah, really good question. Well, first of all, on the local side, um, I, I recommend One Million Cups at, over at the greenhouse. It's where I've met a lot of entrepreneurs in town, and okay. it's, been, it's continued to be a good resource for me. Um, but on a broader sense, um, I remember when I was first thinking about hiring uh, an employee, and uh, um, someone said to me, like, go take, take all the things that you don't like doing and, and, and hire someone to do that so you can think about big picture stuff. I didn't do that. Um, instead, I hired somebody that was kind of out of my budget and that was a lot smarter than me and that had been in the business for a really long time and had a little bit of experience. And it was one of the best decisions I ever made um, because um, even though this person worked for me, um, they were acted as a mentor. And, um, and we still work together today. Uh, for, in fact, the f first two out of three employees were like that. Alexis Grant, our executive editor, and Vishal Matani, our VP of business operations. They're still, still with us, and they um, uh, had, had done it before. And that made all the difference in the world. Thank you. Hi. Um, so I've heard a lot of stories of bloggers who've built blogs like yours and they become profitable and then they just sell it and then they start over and do it again. Yeah. Was there ever a point where you're like, maybe I should just sell it and do it all over again? Or w at what point were you like, oh, I've got this big thing and I'm going to hold on to it and I'm going to make it even bigger? Um, yeah, good question. No, I'm, I'm never selling this thing. <laughs> Uh, I always I always tell all the folks that I work with that I'm going to be here for 40 or 50 years, so they better get used to me. Um, I think it, the only um, asterisk I'll put to that is that, as I mentioned earlier, is that if I ever stopped loving it or ever I got bored, which I don't expect would happen, um, I would look for something to do. I'm not a serial entrepreneur. That's not me. I don't enjoy starting things over and over again. Um, I like building things, and I, I love the idea of seeing how big... Um, I can make this. I, I would assume you've been approached many, many times. And, and the answer is obviously the same, but they, yeah. they keep knocking on your door, right? Yeah. Always flattering. <laughs> Anybody else? I'll run over there. Give me one sec. How fast can I run? <laughs> Sorry for taking up a second Murray one. Again. Um, yeah. I like it. Um, the balance. That's one of the kind of up and coming um, personal finance yeah. um, blogs. And the parent company behind it are just absolutely dominating um, with their fashion blog and everything. Um, do you see them as a competitor? And then what exactly, how are you going to kind of take the, um, that on? Yeah, we do see them as a competitor. Um, uh, and there are a number of personal finance websites that have popped up in the last year or so, and I, every time that happens, I also think it's a little flattering that um, this is a space many people were ignoring, and, and now it's getting now it's getting just as crowded. Um, I think it's a good thing. Like, uh, I don't know about you, but um, I wish I knew a little bit more about personal finance when I left left home and and didn't rack up that fifty thousand dollars in debt. Um, what we're doing differently, though, is uh, is journalism. So I, I'm hiring journalists to work for the company, not just uh, not just uh, bloggers like me. In fact, many of the the blogs that I originally wrote, they've gone back and and um, and edited or taken off the site because we want to make sure we have that same level of fact checking integrity um, um, that a newspaper or or, or a um, uh, major news outlet might have. But what about partnerships? I know syndication of your content is a, is a big part of your strategy. Tell me something about the syndication strategy that you guys have right now, how you collaborate with others, and how maybe you vet yeah. who you work with, who you don't work with, and, and how, how when you collaborate, it's a win. You know, is it a win-win for both sides? And, and just tell us a little bit about that. I think so, yes. We just announced that uh, we're partnering with Yahoo Finance to syndicate content to them, so we're excited Softball. about that. So yeah, we're excited about that. Um, we are living in a distributed content era. Um, people are very, not, not as frequently going to the New York Times.com. You're reading 
that content on Facebook or Snapchat or wherever it might be. So I think we have to be comfortable um, sharing our content sure. with others, but not relying on any single one of them. Google and Facebook. distribute your brand to a new audience, and there's value proposition in, in Yahoo distribution, I would assume, right? That's right, yeah. I mean, Google and Facebook, we, we love them, but they are not our friends. No. They are business partners, and, uh, and they will drop you like a fly. So you have to be prepared to have yeah. a business outside of that. Sure. And uh, since it's a topical, you know, and you're in personal finance, and it is now this the big craze. Let's just talk about Bitcoin a little bit. You know, <laughs> your personal uh, take on it. Everybody wants, you know, everybody wants to get rich quick, and they see Bitcoin as a as a, as an avenue. And I just like to hear your personal opinion on Bitcoin, if you if you have any. Well, I will first of all say that I'm not allowed to give investment advice. <laughs> um, I, I, we are getting this question a lot from readers right now. Yeah. And Should I put my money into Bitcoin? What do you think? And, you know, you guys being an expert, you know, I'm, I'm, how do you, you know? We don't answer that question yes or no, but we do say if you're thinking about um, your investments as short-term wins like that, you're probably thinking about it the wrong way. Um, instead, we would encourage people to uh, go the old-fashioned route and dollar cost average in their investments over many years rather than trying to get a quick do you, buck. Do you have any Bitcoin? I don't have any Bitcoin. I don't have a Bitcoin I, don't have, I have zero Bitcoin. I don't. I'm Bitcoinless. <laughs> I don't have any Bitcoin, I mean, and I don't, two, gonna, I don't think I'm going to have any anytime yeah, soon. Two guys with the most money in the room have zero Bitcoin, guys. I should, <laughs> I should tell you something. <laughs> any more questions before we let this guy go back to work? Well, it's Thursday. I'm going to play Mario Kart. Mario Kart. Hey, Kyle. Hey. Well, first, I just wanted to say the Penny Hoarder is what got me to the Hoff. I took all your freelance writing articles and tips, and you were like my, yes. my blueprint, so thank you. Oh, thank you for telling me that. Amazing. <laughs> That's awesome. You're going to make me write Kyle an affiliate check. <laughs> you just made my day. It's got a new advertiser. But if you were talking to a real small-time blogger, someone just starting, doesn't know anything, maybe you create yeah. a little content, maybe a course, what would be the next small step that someone should take to kind of build out and monetize their blog from there? So you've, you've, uh, you have a, a, a site and a course. What's the next step? Is that right? Basically, yeah, yeah. I think um, because there are so many um, blogs these days that the next step is really to start to find some partnerships that can amplify your reach. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, so find the other blogs in your niche, mm -hmm. reach out to them, take them out for that coffee or, or whatever it might be and figure out how you can help each other grow. Mm 